I was born in 1937. As a boy, I became very interested in astronomy. For this reason, I decided to study mathematics at Cambridge, after which I commenced a PhD in astrophysics in Munich. However, at this time, I became deeply interested in foundational issues in physics, above all, the nature of time. I came to the conclusion that time itself does not exist. Barbara, your last book is called The End of Time. What is it about? It's explaining my idea that time is really an illusion, and motion too, that they are not really there in the, in the external world. They are put into the world by us in the way we interpret it and, and by our brains too. So it's not a linear story? It's not a linear story. Uh, it appears linear to us, but I think this is an artifact of, of the way nature works, that it, it creates this impression in us that there is a linear time, but if we could really see the, the totality of everything, we would see that there's nothing linear about it at all. The main idea that I have is, is the idea of a now. If you could freeze the camera now and just show me as I am and, and all the atoms in my body and everything else, the, the whole of, of Holland, the whole universe, completely frozen like a snapshot, that would be what I call a now. I mean, with the camera looking at me, I don't seem to change very much except by moving my hands around. But if you could look microscopically at my hands and look at my hemoglobin molecules with a real microscope, you would not recognize me from one second to another. In my body, every second, 100 million, million, million of these hemoglobin molecules, which have very, very complicated structures. That number is destroyed and the same number is created. So in a way you should think of each, at each split second, I'm really a very different person. scientific notion of time, the time that, that Christian Huygens first measured accurately with his pendulum clock, that is actually an interesting subject because very little theoretical work has been done on establishing exactly what is that time that is being measured by a pendulum clock or by my wristwatch or an atomic clock. And in fact, I think that the work that I did with my Italian collaborator Bruno Bertotti has shown that really the time that is measured by clocks is in some real sense an average of all the changes in the universe. That if you imagine two nows, they will not be quite the same. There will be some difference between them. And if you work out some weighted average of all of that difference between those two nows, you can call that in some sense the amount of time between them. So this is, this is nothing to do with some substance there, it's just difference between those two things. And I think this is the quantity that is actually being measured by my watch now. So time exists? No, because if you give me two snapshots of nows, one has a certain structure, the other has a certain structure. And from that, just using those, I can tell you how much 
time there is. But we don't have to call it that amount of time. Nothing is changed in those two snapshots by saying they're half an hour apart. But the, so, so in that sense, it's all derived from, from the two snapshots. Now, this is very different from the Newtonian picture, where Newton presupposes there's a river of time flowing that is there before anything is put into it. And what I'm saying is that the things are there first, and the time is deduced from it afterwards. How long does it now last? It has no duration. In, in, in the standard way of thinking, it's absolutely instantaneous. There is no thickness to it. Nothing changes. Now, if nothing changes, you cannot say that time has passed. So these instants, in one sense, are truly eternal because they never change. And on the other hand, because nothing changes, they are experienced as a flash. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice contradiction, really. Mm -hmm. it, the eternal is experienced as, as a flash because nothing changes. How should I picture these nows? Is it, is it, are they juxtaposed? And what is in between them? There is nothing in between them. It, it, it's just, let, let me take, the, each of these are, are, separate, are separate snapshots. They're, they're, they're each separate pictures. Look at them. And there's no, there's no difference. These things are not changed by me reversing the order in which I put them. It may be convenient for the way we think about the world and for ordering our experiences to suppose that these come in a certain order. But in fact, the picture is not changed whether I put it there, whether I put that one first, or, 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 or it should be around that way, shouldn't it? Uh, it doesn't make any difference to the picture itself. The snapshot is completely self-contained, and what we call yesterday is self-contained and has its experience of being yesterday and, and today has memories of yesterday and therefore I, I say that it's later than what we call yesterday but each is actually completely self-contained and there's no reason why you should put one snapshot here and another one there and another one there. Back in 1687 Isaac Newton published his famous Principia, his laws of motion and everything. And here in Holland was Christian Huygens, the greatest scientist of his age until Newton appeared on the scene. And Huygens must, in, probably in this very room, have sat and read Newton's Principia. And he recognized Newton was a great genius, but he says, there must be something wrong with this. There's something not quite right. And what was wrong was that Newton described the whole universe as if it existed in an invisible framework. There was an invisible framework of absolute space, actually just like this room, as if it was filled with glass, but you couldn't see any of the room. That was the invisible framework in, things, in which things moved. And there was a time, said Newton, which flowed like an invisible river, uniformly without reference to anything else. And Huygens thought about this and he thought that can't be right because really all we see is other things. We see things in the room, chairs, outside, we see people walking around in the park and really the only things that can count are the relative things, how one thing is placed relative to another. And he thought about this and he said it must be wrong and he wrote some famous letters to his colleague Leibniz in Germany and they agreed with each other that Mr. Newton cannot be right, that's something wrong there. And it was only much later in the, in the late 19th century when Ernst Mach, the man who made his, became famous for doing his work on the Mach numbers, he was a great philosopher of science. He said, it, it is utterly beyond our powers to measure the changes of things by time. Much rather, time is an abstraction at which we arrive from the changes of things.